If it's coming down to the Sony A7C Mark II and the Sony ZV-E1 for video, which one is worth picking up for video content creation, especially for YouTube creators? It's gonna depend. Now, if you're watching this video, you may have already seen a ton of other videos, even especially those that came out with the A7C Mark II release in addition to the A7C R. So I'm not gonna go in, over into a ton of specs of this one has 33 megapixels and this has 12 megapixels. Like you've probably already seen that and that's stuff that you can read on the spec sheet. I really wanna boil this down to the decision-making thoughts and the things to consider when it comes to these two cameras. And FYI, I have been able to figure out how to get over eight hours of use on the Sony ZV-E1, not turning it off, not babying this camera or anything like that, just letting it run continuously. And yeah, so that's gonna be in a different video, but just FYI, but your mileage still may vary. So the first thing between these two is really gonna boil down to use case. And I talked about this in another video where Sony is really splitting up the lineup for more hybrid centric cameras where you have more beneficial uses for photo and video versus those that are more heavily leaning on the video side. So when you look at a camera like the A7CR, that's something that even though it has great video features, it leans more heavily to the photo based side of things. So looking at these two, you kind of have like the A7C2 that's a hybrid, and then you have the ZV-E1 that is more video centric. Both of these cameras are basically like the children of higher end or just more pricier models. So the A7 IV had the A7C Mark II and the A7S Mark III had the ZV-E1. So there are some things that are a little bit of limiting between either of these, but a lot of the bare bone structure is still there to make these cameras great. And honestly, you could pick up either one and they'd be fantastic. Now, when it boils down to video specs, because if you're talking about YouTube content creation, these cameras need to work. We don't need to be babying these cameras. We don't need to be making the little adjustments. Just, no, it just needs to work. So that's why I said from live streaming or I set the camera up earlier in the day and I'm rolling it for whether I'm doing a meeting, whether I'm doing an interview, whether I'm doing podcast content, like it doesn't matter. Like these cameras need to work. And so that's the kind of perspective that I'm coming at. So if you're doing any of those things, in addition to recording your YouTube video, videos and vertical videos like YouTube shorts and stuff. These cameras, they just need to work. So when you think about video specs, a lot of people that's top of mind problem, Matic type thing is gonna be the 4K60 crop that you're still seeing in the A7C2 that we saw in the A7 IV. And honestly, this sucks. I was super disappointed, but I mean, it's like a given, like we knew it was probably gonna be there. It's like a 90% chance, but we were very hopeful that it's like some magic would be done and somehow we just wouldn't have to deal with that, but it's there. So whether or not you're using 4K60 like that, that's a factor. And again, everyone's different use case is gonna be dependent, but my thing is options. We're past the point of like most cameras, you can pick up anything and they honestly would be great. And it's more into your specific use case and having options at some of these higher price points, if, especially if we're spending the money for it. So if I'm spending over $2,000 for a camera, I want as least amount of limitations as possible. Like I don't even wanna have to think about it. So things like overheating, is not something I even wanna think about when I'm using a camera, it just needs to work. So to know that on the A7C II is gonna have that 4K 60 crop, it has a 1.5 times crop, which puts you essentially into an APS-C mode. To be honest with you, I, I wish this was a different sensor other than the a7 IV. Not that it's fan not fantastic and not that it's not great camera and you can't get great quality because you can, but the a6700 now exists. So we have a camera that is already APS-C that does not have the crop. And if this sensor was plagued so much so that that really was a challenge, let's just use something else from one of the other mini cameras across the lineup. That's just my initial thinking and my hope when I thought this camera would come out. And where this comes into play is like when I was out of town and I was recording my buddy, just mixing up some paints cause he's getting ready to paint uh, his table for his art studio. So I'm in one mindset when I'm creating and whether I'm using APS-C or full frame lenses, I don't have to fully crop into a 1.5 times crop. So when I switch to a lens like I'm using right now, which is my Sony 35 millimeter F 1.8 lens. Yes, this is an APS-C lens, but I only have to crop in, just go right from that 1.1 hit that 1.2 times threshold and the focal range plus the 1.2 times crop takes care of any vignetting and stuff like that. It's not a problem. So when I switched from 4K24, any regular bits that I knew I wanted to record 
to anything that I now wanted to be 4K 60, these are the kind of things you wouldn't think about until you are in the midst of creating and you run into this issue. It's not life or death, obviously, but it is a little bit of a frustration and annoyance when you're in the midst of doing something. Because when I'm recording, I'll switch it between 4K 60 and 4K 120 just to test both of those out. And you have to think about the minimum focusing distance where the end of that lens and that item needs to be in order for it to be in focus. Because if you get too close, the lens is gonna focus within that, you're not within that minimum focusing distance range. So to have to think about that, in addition to like a 4K 60 crop, I just wouldn't want to have to do that. And then you're constantly reframing as well, because there were some points where I had to back up, open up the sliding doors because I just simply ran out of room to get the framing. I would have to back up even more just to account for that little bit extra difference. And sometimes you don't have that luxury. Now, granted, you have APS-C cameras like the A6700 that does it in a 1.5 times crop. So it's not that big of a deal, but it does impact what lenses you use or what lenses you take or need to rent to use in certain use cases, depending on what you're recording or trying to do. And for these cameras to cost the same amount of money, I would hope and I would love to have seen 4K 60, no crop, and then 4K 120. If like, like the fact that the A6700 and the ZVE1 has it, my expectations was the A7C2 would have it, but if it doesn't, it's like, that's okay too, but not really. That's why I kind of hope we had like a different sensor or like they would unlock it and some more magic would be released. So these aren't bad things about the camera or the A7C2, and I'm not trying to bash it or anything like that because the camera is great, the A7 IV is great, but these are the things that you have to think about in the midst of creating or doing what you're trying to do. So if you have somebody recording you in a car like I was doing with Ray and we're just documenting that conversation, I don't have any more real estate to move. I'm stuck in that seat. And plus I still need to be uh, safe with having my seatbelt on and stuff like that. So you need to think about what lenses you're gonna use if you're going with the A7C because in certain scenarios, depending on what you're trying to do, you need something that's gonna give you back that extra width that you're not getting because the camera has a crop. But if you're using longer focal ranges, you, it may not be that big of a deal because like I said, I'm only needed to do a 1.2 times crop barely on my 35 millimeter lens. Now, this is a small difference, but like I talked about before, just the hybrid versus creator centric cameras, the dynamic active stabilization. I, I don't know why I love this so much. Again, like probably just because it problem solves a lot of things for me. And this comes into that 4K 60 rolling shutter issue or just 4K rolling shutter in general. Yes, the A7C Mark II will downsample from a 7K image and squeeze that into 4K. And on the ZV-E1, you're just gonna get 4K at its base output. Neither of these is necessarily bad, but on the A7C2 side, what you're gonna run into is the rolling shutter. Now here's where two instances where this is probably gonna impact more people than not. If you're just doing tripod content, stuff like this, no big whoop de do because you waving your hand around, nobody's like tracking that stuff. Now you'll mostly see people do like that whip pan to kind of show you how slanted the image becomes. But the more realistic use case, if you're not following anything fast, is if you have something moving in the shot. So when I did a long time ago on the A6400, uh, like a skit for my friend and we were recording that for an event she was doing, she opened the door and that door was so slanted simply because of the rolling shutter in 4K or just in the camera on the A6400. Same would be true with the A7C2. The door would be slanted. And so I had to try to fix that as best as I could, even though I was basically just hand holding it in, in a tripod like steady shot. And it just, it was terrible. Now you couple that with the rolling shutter in 4K, in addition to any kind of moving shot, whether you're vlogging, you could be walking around following somebody in church, whatever the thing is. Yeah, the stabilization went from five stops to seven stops, which is definitely better. But if you notice, it's not necessarily that much better and people like Hinboo even saying it's not as improved uh, as you would think with those additional two stops. And I keep coming back to this, but the dynamic active stabilization, in addition to not having to deal with rolling shutter in 4K, makes the ZVE1, in my opinion, a superior choice in that kind of scenario, simply because you're not having to think about how to fix this in post or add additional time by using Catalyst Browse or something, because it looks like the footage or the stabilization is worse than what it actually is in 4K with the addition of the rolling shutter, the ZVE10, and any cameras that use from the A6000 series that same sensor 
those all had the same problems, which is why even with Catalyst Brows, the rolling shutter was still something that had to be accounted for in addition to not having stabilization. So when you pair the two of those together, it is more of a problem than a little bit. If you just kind of want it in camera, then you're looking at dynamic active or active state, which both of these cameras have, but only the ZV-E1 has dynamic active stabilization, which is one of my personal uh, favorites. And I actually really do like it. Now, yes, there is a crop, a 30% crop in dynamic active stabilization on the Sony ZV-E1. And most people don't tell you what that times crop is or how that factors in. It winds up being a 1.43 or roughly a 1.43 times. So almost getting close to that APS-C times crop. But if you're using that with a wider lens, depending on your use case, now, I haven't been able to test the Sony A7C Mark IIs. I don't have that camera in hand. I don't even have the date of if that's even going to be sent to me. So I got to wait or either get that from lens rentals. But depending on how good or poor this is, and probably get the A7 IV footage back out and check that uh, as well. When you have Catalyst Brows working for you, if you need to go past that 1.4 times crop, then it probably isn't going to be super beneficial. You know what I mean? So there's just something to take into consideration because again, in a real life application, these are the real numbers. So if you think in terms of clear image zoom, roughly a 1.4, three times crop, and then whatever it might need to be to fix that individual clips or that footage, if you're dealing with the rolling shutter in addition to uh, not necessarily the best stabilization. And to me, you all can let me know your thoughts in the comment. I feel like the ZV-E1 had better stabilization, but again, it's hard to tell because when you don't have rolling shutter problems on the ZV-E1, you're not seeing how much extra stuff is kind of like being taken away. So I'm definitely looking forward to doing that comparison, but uh, let me know your thoughts uh, on that down in the comments. And then of course, overheating is the topic of the day when it comes to any cameras. And this is only as relevant as it needs to be in your use case. For some of y'all living in hell hot heat environments like Florida, Texas, and for whatever reason, any place hotter than that, I apologize. I don't know what else to tell you because we had one week of extreme heat and I was beside myself. So <laughs> maybe the ZVE1 ain't for you just because the build quality isn't there. I will not know how this works in really uh, hot environments until like I get something like that Ulanzi fan that I've already ordered. The date just keeps getting pushed back on that. So whenever that comes, it comes just to see what it's like. And somebody did mention, a couple people mentioned like having a white camera body would probably attract less heat than the black camera body, which we all know scientifically would be correct. But I never even considered that because if it's too hot for me outside, I sure as hell ain't taking the camera out there. So again, your mileage may vary, but the A7C2, does not have any overheating issues that I've seen when it comes to any video stuff like that. So that little bit extra additional weight is one less thing to even have to think about. And if you think that you would run into any problems whatsoever, it's an easy choice at that point or go with something else. And neither one of these may be right. But for me, I got asked the question a couple of times, would I choose the A7C or am I going to get rid of the ZVE1 and now I'm going to go with the A7C2? It's an emphatic no. I'm absolutely in love with this camera. And the more that I use it, the more that I really, really enjoy using it. Especially like I said, now I figured out my secret sauce to make sure I can get as long as I need to with all day use and not even see an overheating symbol on the camera, then it's like, I'm good to go now. That was the last little piece of a puzzle that I wanted to figure out. But I think that's even absolutely ridiculous to have to figure out on a camera that costs over $2,000. So I'm not gonna rant about it, but. Hmm. But both of these cameras honestly would be great. If you're coming from, like you said, something like the ZV-1, ZV-E10, the cameras would be great. They, they honestly are. And when you have more features uh, at your fingertips, it just becomes that much easier and way more funner to think about what could you create and you know how you could go about approaching stuff with new features and stuff in the camera. And I won't be able to verify for sure if some of the features that I'm finding in the ZV-E1 that I'm not finding in any of the other new releases. Uh, the A7CR is a little bit of a different beast, but I'm finding the ZVE1 has a few extra things in it that I've not heard anybody else talk about. And that like I said, until the manual comes out, then I can verify if the A7C2 has this or not, but that would be some other 
reasons why I would probably pick the ZV-E1 again still over the A7C2. I think at the end of the day though, it's a little bit of a, a disappointment simply because we already have the A7 IV and even though that camera is awesome, we wanted that surprise and delight, you know? And I think we're just so used to expecting it from cameras or we're expecting to see like a miles different of like features and use case and you know, all of that. We're just not seeing that as much anymore. It's really like minor incremental differences when it comes to your efficiencies and how you create or what you need and stuff like that it just becomes less enthusiastic a little bit but it doesn't matter which of these cameras that you get i think they both would be awesome but for me i'm actually looking to get another sony zve1 i really wanted to get the a7c2 but it just doesn't make sense with the 4k 60 crop and still all the limitations of the a7 IV. i get way more for the same price in the ZVE1, but let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Are you considering this or are you looking at something else like the A6700, which we'll talk about in a different video? But as I love to end all of my videos, guys, create, post, repeat, and I will see y'all in the next one. Peace.